Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you all very much for logging on, um, checking in uh, to uh, the final presentation this evening on how to invest for growth. My name is Simon Edelston. I'm one of three fund managers who runs the Artemis Global Select Fund, which is a UK unit trust, and also a fund called the Midwind Investment Trust, which is a investment trust quoted on the London Stock Exchange. So, um, as ever, a couple of disclaimers that you can read at your leisure on the two funds that I've mentioned just now. Um, but what I want to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the macro environment, a little bit more about what makes stock markets go up and down, um, and also what perhaps can cause risks. Um, the main point I'd like to emphasize is that as we stand today and probably for the next period and certainly the last six months, there's not been business as usual. It's not been stock markets as usual. And it's certainly um, not been society as usual. And I think um, although strong companies, good growth companies, as the other Simon just said, um, generally get through these periods of turbulence better than weak companies. And I'll talk quite a bit about that as we go along. Uh, one still needs to bear in mind that as we stand today, um, we're not looking at uh, an economic situation which is going to be that similar to the massive bull market we've seen in the previous 10 years. Uh, things are going to change. It's worth trying to think about what's going to change, anticipate events, and make sure that one's got a portfolio and one's got one's savings organized in a way so that one can cope with further unexpected events because there will be further unexpected events. And we're not going to pretend, I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to anticipate them, but there are ways of building a portfolio, setting out a portfolio, which can mean that at least you're trying to protect your capital against difficult events, unexpected problems coming along. Um, now the stock market, as, as Simon illustrated, and as I'm sure you all know, went down extremely sharply when the virus was upon us in March. Uh, for global equity managers, of course, they had an advantage. They saw the virus coming along in Asia. Uh, we had a few weeks notice. Possibly we had a few weeks notice on our government, which seemed to take a little while to respond to what was clearly emerging as a major um, international virus out outbreak. So the stock market went down. There was really quite a lot of panic at the bottom, uh, more panic than I've seen in markets for quite a while. This bull market's been pretty solid. And now we bounce really all the way back up again in dollar terms the uh, msci all world the global equity index is uh, really quite strongly up um, over the last year now and even in sterling terms um, it, it's up which may surprise people when they look around and they look at the state of the economy state of the world economy read about it in the paper um, the reason that the equity markets found so much, though, has really been mainly been focused just on technology companies and quite a small number of very large household names, big caps, uh, Apple, Amazon, the Fangs, as they're called, have dominated the recovery in the stock market. Um, and this has been, perhaps they've been bought because they've traded well, perhaps they've been bought because they're seen as safe havens. They've certainly all produced pretty good um, results during this period, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but looking forward, the other things I think we need to cover are uh, that we're in a market where political decisions, like the closure of economy, lockdown, whether lockdown comes back is, is, is still going to be around, unpredictable. Uh, and also people are questioning whether the valuation some of these tech stocks have got onto is now excessive, despite the growth that they've proven that they can show. Uh, so our emphasis here in the Artemis Global Select Fund, anyway, is to spread your money around a little bit more thinly. Um, and so we tend to um, top and tail our investments a bit more, spread them around the world a bit more, try to look for better value for money. It's difficult valuing technology companies. It's difficult valuing high growth companies because that growth itself is, is quite unpredictable. Uh, and as Simon illustrated, if you've got a company growing at 20% per annum, what looks like an expensive company can become a very cheap company as long as it delivers that growth. But all the same, Given the uncertainties in the world and given that we're starting from a point where valuations are quite high, our emphasis at the moment is just to make sure one's got eggs in, in more baskets, spread more around the world into different industries, into different growth opportunities. Um, whoops. So um, what's happened over the last year? Well, 
uh, I'm sure you all know this, the good companies have just done a hell of a lot better and, and really leading from the very large ones, not just the very large ones, a lot of small ones have done well as well, but really for Amazon's operating cash flow to increase by 40%. I think we all found, not to our great surprise, that Amazon went from being uh, slightly dubiously um, low tax paying and criticized company to being one that we all totally relied on and we weren't, weren't about to criticize them at all, uh, bailed us out in terms of how we got through living through the pandemic earlier in the year. All the same, as I'm sure most of you know, it has enormous underlying cash flow, it has very high sales growth, but it also invests vast amounts. So it's very difficult to work out the underlying cash flow that you, you need to work out to know whether the shares are still cheap or expensive. And the shares have gone up enormously this year, last year, and the year before. And now you're in a position where this massive company is so large uh, that you're always going to have some uh, attention from politicians, not least because they don't pay tax. Uh, there's been an inquiry in Congress recently, you may have seen in the paper about a month ago, uh, and also the New York Attorney General's just launched an investigation into whether Amazon damages too much high street retailers, traditional retailers, uh, in terms of its business practices, or whether this is just an unfortunate consequence of how well they do their job. Um, so a lot of the really high growth stocks, the proven high growth stocks in technology had a, had a very good pandemic, um, but also there's a range of other companies uh, which are coming to the fore, which have shown their worth going forward. So I'm going to talk a little bit about medical testing opportunities in the future, work from home technology, some of the smaller companies which help one work from home, and also, also companies in the automation space, because we're about to now see a range of uh, government interventions trying to get people to, uh, trying to get economies going again and trying to get people to invest more for the future. Whoops. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go forwards um, two slides. So the mirror of that, I suppose, is that um, the problem sectors of the past have carried on being the problem sectors um, of the future. And in fact, um, companies which have found life difficult over the last few years have found life really, really difficult um, through the pandemic. Um, you would have seen some of the most reliable dividend payers in, in, in the world. I think Shell in particular was very proud of its uninterrupted dividend growth record over, I think, ever since the uh, ever since the war. And finally, they, they, they announced they had to cut their dividend a lot. Uh, BP's dividend is hard. So companies in more problematic sectors, some of the sectors one would avoid if, like us, you, you try to look for sustainable investment companies, not in troubled industries, not in industries which uh, damage the environment. Uh, they had problems. But then it, but the, even companies like property owners, uh, into the owner of the Trafford Centre. Uh, the shops were shut for a while. They were enormously indebted. Another point Simon made, avoid companies at times of trouble, which owe the bank a lot of money. Um, they owed four and a half billion pounds. This is a FTSE company, uh, and it went bust um, earlier this year. Uh, so I think most of us could have anticipated, or as the pandemic panned out, it was fairly straightforward to an anticipate that companies in the tourism sector, the restaurant sector, were going to have trouble. Uh, but it was harder to see that an oil company would have trouble. You look back at the pandemic, why would oil have trouble? Well, actually, the oil industry had its own problems. OK, people drove less, but also there's just too much oil being produced in the, in the world and people are using less of it. So probably it's this long term move towards very welcome move towards renewables, which has undermined the value and the, and the long term prospects of oil stocks as well. So again, it wasn't just that the technology companies and the classic growth companies were producing really good results. It was also that the other part of the market, the so-called value part of the market or the yield part of the market, was producing pretty bad results uh, most of the way um, uh, through the pandemic. And as the pandemic worked its way through, those bad results seemed to get worse and worse. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we call ourselves thematic investors. This reflects something that was said in the in the earlier presentation. Just avoid avoid sectors which um, this is our relative performance compared with the index. Um, and the reason that our fund has done well is because we've avoided the oil and gas sectors. We've avoided the bank sector. Um, these are difficult sectors. Difficult sectors make money in for a long time. We've avoided the real estate sector and mining by and large. 
uh, and concentrate on sectors which have generally been strong, software being an obvious example, um, uh, and IT services being a, a, an example. Um, but the key point here is uh, the way in which you outperform a market like this, it's not it's one thing to have your money in the good sectors, but it's a bigger thing to avoid having your money in the bad sectors. And, and it's generally avoiding losing money in weak industries, weak sectors, companies with too much debt uh, is one of the key guiding uh, principles that you want in any balanced approach to running a fund in markets like this. Uh, as I say, um, some of the factors, a lot of you would have read a lot, uh, I'm sure, over this year about environmental, social and governance um, priorities. Um, for a lot of investors like me who've been doing the job for a, a few decades, none of this is new. I mean, environmental liabilities have been around for 20, 25 years. I remember um, people having to avoid companies which had asbestos in the 90s and certainly avoiding uh, oil companies which had massive spills like BP had in in, in the mid 2000s uh, was absolutely key to understanding the risk factors involved. Anyhow, these have come to the fore. There are a lot of people who claim that they specialize in this. I mean, for me, it's just part of good investing, part of how you should assess any company uh, long term. Um, but it also means that uh, if you take governance seriously in particular, I think environmental speaks for itself. Standards are fairly consistent around the world. Uh, but governance issues also mean that you've got to keep an eye. If you're invest, you can invest in a good business, but if it's in a difficult country or in a weak a country which has a weak currency um, or a country which manages to irritate President Trump and get struck off by the Americans, you can find yourself in a good stock which is stranded by international affairs, by political decisions. And so those sorts of um, governance issues, uh, and obviously you need to be able to trust the, um, the management of any company that you uh, invest in, and you've got to know that the rule of law applies in any country that you invest in, so that you as a shareholder have protected rights and can claim those rights if anything goes wrong. So there are a number of factors which have hit the headlines recently. Uh, for us, it's all about um, being responsible investors, uh, taking a long-term view, communicating with the management of the companies that we invest in. Um, we don't go out of our way to buy bad companies and try to make them better. We think that that's a rather peculiar game. We try to buy good companies and, and talk to them. Um, but all companies, all companies that you have a proper relationship long term are perfectly happy to have a, a, a sensible conversation these days about any of these risk factors. And if they think it's going to improve our shareholder returns, so much the better. Um, so as I said earlier, the themes that we invest in, uh, I'll show you here, that these have been pretty consistent over the 10 years, the nearly 10 years now that uh, the unit trust has been up and running. Um, we've been running the investment trust only for six years, but, but it's quite similar in many ways. And yeah, we look for long-term growth themes. Um, hopefully, most of these will explain themselves, uh, even though the stocks are probably not stocks that you uh, would have heard of. Um, some of them are big companies. Merck is the world leader in cancer immunotherapy. It's the biggest hold, holding in our healthcare, um, the healthcare part of our fund. It's also popped up, by the way, as having one of the best candidates for a vaccine for the virus, uh, even though... Uh, there are more famous vaccines out of Oxford University, which is looking very, very good, very, very good with Astra and some other ones were trumpeted by um, some American companies. But Merck's also a player there. Cancer immunotherapy, though, for us is a massive long term improvement, not just in cancer care, but also in costs uh, by keeping cancer patients, uh, taking cancer patients through cancer cures with immunotherapy. Uh, the side effects, the quality of life afterwards is so much better that the total life cost is, is much, much lower than traditional chemotherapy. Um, so, you know, that's a growth area which not all growth investors look at, not all growth investors invest in, um, where the shares are quite a lot cheaper than other shares. They have defensive qualities of their own, and it adds diversity to the fund. Um, but from the top down, automation, I think um, we've all read quite a lot about the new wave of robotics coming along, smaller robots, smarter warehouses, Daifuku, a Japanese company not many people have heard of, one of our best performing investment, investments. Um, it is the world leader in taking a warehouse and making it automated. Any retailer who wants to compete with Amazon needs an automated warehouse. So they've had a fantastic time over the last uh, eight or nine years. 
Uh, online services, we're all doing a lot more on the internet. Equinix is the largest data center management company in America. As the amount of data we produce goes up, the amount of data centers you need goes up, the demand goes up. Louis Vuitton, you've probably all heard of, uh, emerging market consumer stock, mainly in terms of its growth, but sells a lot of luxury handbags and a lot of champagne in developed markets as well. Uh, actually cope with this year pretty well, which is a surprise when you consider how many shops and how little partying there has been going on. But fantastically well-run company. Uh, it'll probably have better years uh, than this one, but it's managed to get through it and bought Tiffany in the process. Um, scientific equipment makers, uh, Thermo Fisher, again, the first company the American government went to when they wanted um, new tests for the virus. Um, so uh, world leader in um, scientific equipment anyway, but also because of its technology, go-to company uh, in terms of um, coming up with solutions for the problems that we've had recently. And then we also have investments in um, companies which help us go on the internet, um, spend more time on the internet. I'm afraid that's true for all of us, uh, but also companies in the renewable energy area, especially offshore wind companies, which have done us very well over time. So as I said earlier, we try to spread our investments across a number of different growth themes, all of which we think have long-term potential. The amount of money we have in each theme is going to depend on the valuations. And we probably move our money around a little bit more than other people because when we find that the market's paying all its attention to one part of the market, say Amazon, which we have been taking profits in recently, uh, we will generally find some other parts of the market that people haven't paid so much attention to where we think you're going to get better value for money and the same quality of company. So we're never looking to move money so far away that we end up in companies we don't think are high quality. Uh, an example of a, a, a company we bought during the crisis where we just think that the investment thesis has got better and better. Uh, Train Technologies uh, was spun out of Ingersoll Rand a couple of years ago. It's the American leader in air conditioning. In the past, the main driver of new air conditioning demand has been better offices, better energy efficiency, air conditioning systems powered by solar panels. It seems quite obvious now if you're in California, when the sun shines, you need the air conditioning to run, so you wire it through. Um, but with the pandemic and the new rules about getting people in and out of power blocks, large offices, they also, as I'm sure you've heard, they, they want the air filtered more often, they want it um, take, uh, uh, changed in an office more frequently in order to reduce the risk of infection. And so Train and also uh, Daikin in Japan have both seen a massive increase in orders uh, for their air conditioning systems over, over the next few years. And these companies being industrial companies, slightly more cyclical companies, don't trade on those very high ratings that some of the technology stocks have ended up on. So. We tend to do a little bit of taking profits in the stocks that the focus of the markets are on, try to find some new ideas, spread the money around, spread our risk, and also look for a broader range of ways in which we might get rewarded. So the Global Select Fund, as, as I say, we're diversified across a range of different themes, some of which I've explained to you. It means that our top 10 holdings are only about 25% of assets. That's a much more spread portfolio than most growth funds. Um, we have about 65 stocks in the fund, but our biggest investments are 2 2.5% of our assets, not 5%, which is uh, quite typical of our, our peer group. Um, all of the investments that we have, are, or, or the vast bulk of them, are, are going to grow faster than the average um, to get that um, the average stock. So that's in terms of what people expect, but it's also in terms of the history of these companies. They generally have proven products that they're rolling out around the world. Uh, I'm afraid that that tends to mean that we'll have most of our money outside the UK, um, most of it outside Europe, frankly. The growth stocks of the world we are finding tend to be in Asia and America still. Uh, but they'll all have strong balance sheets and they'll all show strong barriers to entry. It's not enough just to find a company uh, which is seeing sales growth. You also need it to show that it's got some sort of uh, ability to protect its market from new entrants. The world is a very, very competitive place. And if you've got a good business in a good area, uh, you have to be wary all the time that, uh, a new, you know, that lots of other people aren't going to come in and try to eat your lunch. So we're always looking for a, a little speciality or a patent protection or a network effect, which means these companies got good barriers to entry because that's what will ensure that their high returns on capital persist in future. Uh, and then um, 
uh, the end of the presentation really is just uh, showing the performance figures uh, for the fund over the last year. Um, the fund has coped well in bull markets, but it's also held up pretty well in bear markets. Um, because we have this more spread approach, we have more eggs and more baskets. Uh, sorry, we have eggs spread across different baskets. The fund has tended in the past anyway not to go down as much when the, when the stock market uh, panics as uh, some other funds. So if you look back at the history of the fund, you'll see you we won't always keep up with a raging bull market. We don't even intend to. Um, but the fund will also tend to go down, has tended to go down in the past slightly less than markets when they have sharp sell-offs. And so in a, in a world that we continue to think has plenty of growth opportunities at sensible prices, but which also has this background that we're not going back to business as usual. The politics, unpredictable political and economic events will be in the background, will come along and derail things from time to time. Um, we, we prefer this style, a little bit more caution, a bit, little bit less greed. And uh, as long as uh, the growth comes through in the long run, we still think that we should be able to produce very good investment returns for uh, patient investors. And that's all I was going to say. I've no idea whether that's 20 minutes, but I'll hand back now.